Thank you so much for being. You can be seated. I, I forget about that. And uh, when we're doing our offering and all that, we, we, we're not used to having y'all in church with us. So we kind of forget the routine of you may be seated, welcome visitors and all of that. We're so been so focused talking to that camera right there. <laughs> I got to be careful. Last week they said, don't forget to talk to the people in the audience because there's people sitting there. Amen. And again, it warms our hearts so much that uh, for you to be here with us and uh, to be in the house of God last service and just getting to see your face. We know you're there. We know you've been faithful and committed to the church and the vision here. And thank you so much. And thank you for being here. And those of you online, thank you for your participation and your comments. You know, we're living in the greatest time to be alive. The greatest time to be alive. I said the greatest time to be alive. And I know I ain't getting a lot of amen in here right now because they're like, hello, do you not realize what's going on in our world? And I know maybe at your house you almost clicked off there just because of me saying that. Listen, how I know it's the greatest time to be alive because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, not last month, last year. Today is the day of salvation. When you wake up tomorrow, that same scripture says today is the day of salvation. What does that word salvation mean? Freedom, deliverance, whatever's held you back, set free, made away, made clean, made clear. Listen, be redeemed, be purchased out from where you are. Today is the day of salvation. It means every day of my life when I wake up, it's the greatest day to be alive. Because listen, God does his greatest work when the enemy is at his greatest work. The Bible says where sin abounds, grace God's favor much more abounds. Now you can get caught up in all the sin going on, all the wrong going on, and be baffled about that. And oh my God, look at all the evil, look at all the bad. But my Bible tells me where sin abounds, grace, God's favor, much more abounds. Come on, somebody say, much more abounds. So I'm not gonna let that the amount of sin abounding distract me from believing that I'm living in the greatest day to be alive. It's a day that people can get saved, people can be delivered, people can be set free, people can have a brand new life, they can start a new journey. Come on, somebody. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. See, for the believer, we should be looking for in this unshakable kingdom, this unshakable mindset, when we see a lot of sin, a lot of wrong, a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of disobedience, we shouldn't be the one shrinking back. No, child of God, the church, the children of the most high God, we should be looking for that abounding grace, that abounding favor, that too much God, that over and above, that beyond normal. Come on, don't shout me down as I'm preaching so good in here today. See, what the enemy wants to get you distracted on is he wants to get us looking at the wrong, the bad, the evil. Why? Because that depresses you. It'll cause you to be offended. It'll, it'll cause you to shrink back. It'll cause you to get consumed with all the evil, all the negative. And if anything, it will shake your faith because you want to know, God, why are you allowing this to happen? Why is God allowing it? I thought God loves me. I thought God cares about me. Why is he allowing this to go on? Why is he allowing evil to exist? Because he said, where sin abounds, where evil abounds, over the top, my grace is sufficient for thee. When you're weak, there I'll be the strongest. My grace much more abounds. Think about it. If you and I started thinking on the much more favor abounding to me, the much more favor, God's grace, his unearned, his unmerited, undeserved, free favor of God. See, you wouldn't be looking for more evil. 
You wouldn't be looking for more problems. You wouldn't be engulfed with that. You'd be like, okay, okay, all this bad going on, all this evil going on. Goodness is coming my way. Favor's coming my way. Something great's about to happen to me because where sin abounds, God's grace, his undeserved, his unmerited, his free favor abounds. My Lord, I, I gotta walk sideways from flying right now because if God, see this unshakable kingdom I'm talking about, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. And everything that could be shook is being shaken right now. But friend, let me tell you something about God. The only time God shakes anything is that which is not connected, that which does not remain, that is not what is not producing, it falls by the wayside. See, John chapter 15, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Come on, somebody say, he's the vine, we're the branches. And he said, my father is the husband. In other words, he's the groundskeeper, God is. And he said, everything that does not produce, every branch that does not produce fruit, God takes it away. In other words, he's not taking it away so that the tree dies he prunes the tree so the branch produces more fruit. In other words, when all the shaking's going on and God allowing the shaking to take place, he's saying, listen, I'm trying to get rid of everything that's keeping you from abounding, that's keeping you from succeeding, that's keeping you from surviving, that's keeping you from going over the top. It's an unshakable kingdom. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12, I wanna read our text for this entire series that we're in. And in verse 12 in the message translation, verse 25 says, so don't turn a deaf ear to these gracious words. I love it. Gracious words, favorable words. If those who ignored earthly warnings didn't get away with it, what will happen to us if we turn our backs on heavenly warnings? His voice that time shook the earth to its foundations. This time he's told us this quite plainly. He will also rock the heavens one last shaking from top to bottom, from stem to stern. The phrase one last shaking means a thorough house cleaning, getting rid of all the historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. Think about how timely this word is. In Hebrews. Here now, everything around us is having to do with whatever is essential can stay, but whatever is non essential has to go. And here in the message translation, he says, one last shaking means a house cleaning, getting rid of all the historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. Do you know what? When God's shaking things, he's only trying to remove the thing that's held you back, that has stopped you from producing, that has stopped you from growing, stopped you from being all that he's called you and created you to be. Come on, somebody put an amen to that. In other words, God, shake everything that could be shook. Get rid of everything that needs to go bye-bye. I don't wanna hold on to nothing keeping me or hindering me from moving forward in my walk with you. Come on, somebody put an amen on that. Verse 28 says, do you see what we've got? An unshakable kingdom. Come on, somebody say, an unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be 
not only thankful, but brimming with worship, deeply reverent before our God. For God is not an indifferent to bystanders. He is actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn. God himself is a consuming fire. In other words, every time I've read that and preparing for this message in this series, my whole theme and my whole mindset is God, I need you to burn everything that needs to burn. I need you to burn fear, burn doubt, burn worry, burn misunderstanding, burn not knowing everything that needs to be burned. Let it burn, let it burn. Why? Because another translation says, that which remains, then be of God. In other words, those that remain, the committed, the steadfast, after the shaking has happened, he says, whatever remains, that is of God. Come on now. That means whatever you're left with after the shaking, that means that's God. That's God. That's God. You don't got to wonder another day, what is God? What is not God? Come on now. He said, let it all be shaken. That could be shook. And we're experiencing a whole lot of shaking going on. Uh, Not only is the world and worldly things being shaken, but the church is being shaken. I'm not talking about the building because we're the church, we know that. This is just God's house where the church comes together to have church, amen. But people's faith is being shaken. People's love walks being shaken. Relationships are being shaken. Come on, they always say, you'll find out who your real friends are when everything that can be shook has been shaken. When what remains, the Bible says, that is of God. You know, when your friendship goes through a real struggle, you find out, or you're going through a real struggle, find out who your friends are. God may not be causing the shaking, but in God allowing it to be shook, he's trying to find out where are the believers, where are those are gonna trust me, Where are those that are gonna stand and keep on standing? Where are my people at? Where are those that are gonna move forward and not be deterred, not be distracted anymore? Come on now. I wrote this down a couple weeks ago and preparing for this, I heard the Lord say to me that what lies behind us and what lies in front of us cannot compare to what lies within us. In other words, there's a hope that is on the inside of you. Romans chapter 12 says God has given every one of us a measure of faith. Come on now, an ability to believe God. Every one of us has a measure of faith. We all got the same size. God didn't give one person big faith, another person strong faith. The Bible says he's given every person a measure of faith. Jesus made a statement one day, said if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, which is the smallest seed of seeds ever created, ever made. If you only had faith that size, you could speak to the mountain and command it to be removed and it has to obey you. In other words, It doesn't mean you gotta have big faith, strong faith, a lot of faith. You just need to be exercising the faith you have. See, the enemy is the thief. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And I've said a thousand times that enemies or thieves don't rob from abandoned buildings. If you're being messed with, if the devil's knocking on your door, then he has found you something of importance, of significance, you matter and you matter to God or the enemy wouldn't be messing with your family, messing with your marriage, messing with your money, messing with you as an individual. Psalms 37 verse 34 says, wait patiently for God. Don't leave the path. He will give you your place in the sun 
while you watch the wicked lose it all. See, listen, when things are being shaken, this, un, this remnant of this unshakable kingdom, this church, this group of believers that says, you know what? I may not be the best believer. I may not know the most about the Bible, but here's one thing I know. I know that Jesus saved me. I know he delivered me. I know he took me out of darkness. I know he's given me a brand new life. Amen. Amen. I'm gonna give you, I didn't give it to the second service last week, so I'll share it in the second service today. Three basic points of how to be unshakable, how to have unshakable faith. How many of y'all wanna know how to be unshakable or have unshakable faith? Come on, don't get too excited out there. I need an amen. Number one is, it's how I think. The three points today, Think, be, do. Somebody say, think, be, do. Come on, say it out loud. Think, be, do. In other words, I want to help provoke you in your thought pattern because you'll never be better if you don't start thinking better. So I got to start with my thoughts. I got to start with my thinking because I'm not gonna be better if I don't start thinking better. I talked about attitude this past Sunday, uh, past Wednesday night, that it, your, your attitude is totally linked to your thoughts. You got stinking thinking, you're gonna have a stinking attitude. You got good thoughts, you'll have a good attitude. In other words, the attitude is the response to your thought life. Amen. A second Chronicles 16 verse nine says, for the eyes of the Lord are running to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for someone to show himself strong through. You know, right now God is looking at you. He's looking at me. It's like, I'm wanting to show myself strong. Just like my son talked about a minute ago. I'm wanting to show myself strong in you. The eyes of the Lord are, are searching. Who's going to be the one to say, Lord, look no further. You can use me. You can do it through me. I want to be a part of the unshakable kingdom. See, it starts in my thinking. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul wrote this letter to the church. He says, Brethren, I beseech you therefore by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Come on, somebody say reasonable. God never asked the unreasonable. He's only looking for the reasonable. And he said that if you will renew your mind and not be conformed to the fashion or the superficial customs of this present age, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, not the removal of your mind. Listen, it should not be said of the church, the Christians, them people done lost their minds since they started going to church. We should be the ones saying the people in the world, they ain't in a right mind. Those people out there acting crazy, hating on people, being unjustly, unfairly, causing judgment and horrible things, they ain't in their right mind. The people of God are in their right mind. Come on, somebody. I got a sound mind. See, he says, if you keep paying attention to what's going on in the world, your mind, your thoughts are gonna be fashioned after worldly things. Hello? So, Every time something bad happens, you're shaken to the core. Oh my God, something else? Can you believe how much worse is it gonna get? You're shaken. He says, but if you'll renew your mind, not remove it, renew it to what the word of God has to say. You'll be able to prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. Said it before, I believe it, it bears repeating that 
he uses this word transformation, transform. Because God isn't looking for you to change your thoughts. He wants your thoughts to be transformed. Can I help you with the importance of that? So that you can become unshakable, your faith become unshakable, unchangeable, unmovable. A caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It goes through a transformation process that it's, it stops existing or being a caterpillar the way it thinks, acts, responds, does. And it transforms into a butterfly. The whole thinking changes. The whole actions, the whole think, be, do is completely different of a butterfly than it is of a caterpillar. What's Paul saying? You're never going to be better. You're never going to do better if you don't think better. And the only way you're going to think better is if you get your thoughts, your mind, be transformed. The only way I could be tired of something is thinking on it too long and it keeps happening over and over. See, God wants me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind no matter how much bad happens to me, I don't start letting it conform me. I guess nothing good happens to me. I guess I'm just one of those that have bad things all the time. I mean, you know, uh, without any luck or good luck, I don't ever have luck. And just negative, negative, negative. Why? Because the enemy's wanting you to transform or stay formed by negative thoughts, negative things happening. And God says, listen, the only way you're going to see better, do better, be better is you got to start being transformed by negative new information, new thoughts. Come on, somebody. It's transformation. In other words, if you were a caterpillar, he wants you to become a butterfly. A butterfly don't even remember the feelings or effects of a caterpillar. If the butterfly was flying by and something thumped the caterpillar, the butterfly wouldn't go, ow! Boy, I remember back in the day, I was a caterpillar. I'm not a caterpillar no more, but you better be glad I'm not a caterpillar. See, Paul's really relating this to the born again experience for the believer. See, Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you be born again, you'll never see or inherit the kingdom of God. He said, what do I got to do to be born again? He said, you've got to change the way you think. You've got to become born again. In other words, old things have to pass away and you've got to allow new things to begin, a brand new you, not a reconditioned you, not a refashioned you, not a glued back together you. A brand new you, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things passed away. Everything's made new. Come on, somebody give the Lord a shout of praise. And I'll just, I'll tag it on. The only way we'll see our world be better is when our world thinks better. If you keep thinking corruption, you'll keep being corrupted and you'll keep doing corruptible things. But you can't think corruption. And that's what goes on with the enemy. He, he drowns us with the negative opposition. Negative things. Why? Because if he could cause you to fashion your thoughts by what you see, what you hear, then you'll be after those thoughts. Amen. Number two is you can be everything God says you could be. He told Jeremiah chapter one, said, Jeremiah, before you was even in your mama's womb, I knew you, 
I ordained you. I made plans for you. I prepared for you, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, wherever you go, I've already ordained. I've already predestined you, Jeremiah. You're gonna be everything I said you could be. And Jeremiah began to disqualify himself. Jeremiah chapter one, he began to disqualify himself. I can't do that. I'm too young. Everything God said he could do, he started disqualifying himself because he said, there's no way. Why? Because Jeremiah couldn't see it happening. Jeremiah didn't think he was good enough for it to happen. So Jeremiah didn't think he could be what God says he could be. But, Jer- but God told us that Jeremiah, You're gonna represent me in the nations. I will put my words in you. When you need to talk for me, I'll give you the words to say. See, God don't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. You may be sitting there today. You may be watching online. God, I don't know if I can be what you think I can be, do what you think I can do. He said, listen, I'm not calling those that think they can. I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to give you the ability. I'm going to give you the strength. I just need you to open your mouth and let me put the words in there. Amen. Amen. Number three, he says, think, be, do. Philippians chapter four, I believe it's in verse 19, says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How many times have you and I been guilty? I know I have. God, I don't know if I can do that. God, I don't know if I can do that. I know you want me to do it, but I don't think I can do it. God, I know I need to stop that. I don't think I can do that. I don't think I can do it. Come on, anybody other than me? You know you're to forgive somebody. God, I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't do that. What do we do? We are reconditioning our mind of what we can't do. When Philippians 4, 19 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Think about this. Scripture says you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength to do it. God ain't asking you to do it without him giving you the ability to do it. God ain't asking you to do something. He ain't gonna give you the power to do it. See, he don't call the talented, the gifted, the able. He gifts, he talents the called. He makes able the called. What is he looking for? Your yes, my yes to not let what's going on around me shake my faith, shake my love walk. You know, it's like everybody wants mercy when they're the ones that fail. But no one wants to give mercy when somebody else fell. (laughs) Come on, when you fall in sin, Thank you for your mercy. It's new every morning. Thank you for your mercy. It's new. Somebody else makes a mistake. Oh my God. It's like mercy has left your thought pattern. Mercy is far from you. Those that have been shown mercy should be the greatest in showing mercy. I said those that have been shown mercy or given mercy should be the greatest in showing our given mercy. Amen. See, you would almost think someone that is unmerciful has either never been shown mercy or they forgot how much mercy was given them. See, I don't ever want to forget what he's brought me from. Amen. I I want to be grateful and thankful. God, you brought me through that. This is nothing. God, you did that. 
This is no big deal. You did it before. God, you'll do it again and again and again and again. No matter the mountain, no matter the obstacle, no matter how bigger the problem gets, God, you made a way before. You'll make a way again. Why? I'll never think better or be better or do better if I don't change my thought process. See, one way the world system controls you is to get every news station to say the same thing. Why? Faith for anything comes by hearing. Hello? So the more you hear it, the more you believe it. The more you believe it, the more you talk about it. You think about it. Now you start being what you've always heard. Now you start doing what you've always done. And God's word's the same way. You're not gonna have faith for this if you don't hear it. If, you got, if you're spending more time hearing the report of what's going on outside these four walls than what God is doing inside these four walls. And I'm not talking about those walls. I'm talking about the walls in your life, the walls in your mindset, the walls in your life. What is going on in here should be more important than what's going on out here. Amen. Come on, would you stand with me today and as we prepare to pray and give people an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Lord of their life.